my commentary on Isaiah 53, verse by verse, as it covers me, not Jesus Christ, not the people of Israel, the Jewish people. Isaiah 52 ends with verse 12. Isaiah 52, 13, 14, and 15 is a completely new chapter. The very beginning of Isaiah 53. In other words, Isaiah 52, and there are many references there to the servant, the Jewish people, as God often and quite frankly always refers to them. He never refers to them as the <coughs> his righteous servant. 52 ends at verse 12. Picking up with 52 verse 13 is really starting Isaiah 53 verse 1. It just got divided improperly. There's a lot to that, and I have that uh, in my book. Isaiah 52, verse 13. Indeed, and this starts out in quotes, 13, 14, and 15 are a multiple quote verses. In other words, this quote that 13 starts with ends at the end of verse 15. Indeed, my servant shall prosper, be exalted, and raised to great heights. My servant shall prosper, be exalted, and raised to great heights. This is in Midrash form. That's when you read a verse and generally break it down into parts and, and then give commentary on each of the parts. My servant is now the sinful, blemished, and disfigured Gentile who becomes, quote, my righteous servant, close quote, that's by God, in Isaiah uh, chapter 53, verse 11. After passing the test of devotion in Isaiah 53, verse 10, when he makes himself an offering for guilt, in a covenant with God, agreeing to go through the suffering of God's fire of refinement. There's much more on that when I get to verse 10 and 11. God's righteous servant is a man who is made suitable in the Lord's fire of refinement of punishment, maltreatment, chastisement, bruising, and crushing. Now the key to this is the book of Ezekiel. He literally goes through everything that the man of Isaiah 53, the righteous servant, goes through, except he's not crushed with disease, he's not familiar with disease, and he is not wounded. Now, all these other words, not treatment, punishment, chastisement, bruising, crushing, that are in Isaiah 53, apply to him too. And again, this, I have a lot more on that. And the purpose of this is to, is, is, is to make the many righteous. That's what this story is about. Chapter 53, it starts out with the people who need righteousness. And that's the first six verses, and I'm getting to them. And they are multiple quote verses also. Quote starts at verse 1 of chapter 53 and ends at the end of verse 6. And that's what it's all about. Here's this man. You're going to see what kind of problems he has and how lowly he was. And rises up to be God's righteous servant speaking to God. As it turns out in the day of the Lord. And you can find this in so many of my other videos. Which is this day. Because Jeremiah 31 talks about a time to come, and it connects with Malachi 3, uh, chapter 3, which is the last page of the prophets that God speaks to his prophets, and God prophesizes a day of the Lord. And it says, uh, so to make the many righteous, and through him the Lord's purpose might prosper.
in the day of the Lord, there are four men to come. This is the only unfulfilled prophecies of God himself. Four men to come. That would be the righteous servant himself, the prophet like Moses, who's never appeared, Elijah, and we find he's the messenger in Malachi 3, and, uh, of course, the anointed one, Mashiach, the descendant of King David from Isaiah chapter 11. Now, I, as I said, this is verse by verse and how I sit them. God came to me at birth, but did not speak to me as he did to Ezekiel immediately uh, when his spirit lit upon Ezekiel. Then he could hear God speak. God is in his spirit. I have a little more on that in here, but it's also in many of the videos. There's only one description. And the sages knew. The sages knew, although it's totally ignored today in Judaism, who, who says this, Isaiah 53, uh, the Jewish people as one man, Israel, a patriarch. Um, you, you have to have the description. And they, they believed and said the descendant of King David of chapter 11, the Mashiach, was described in Isaiah 53. They even had a name for him in the Babylon Talmud, the leper scholar. And that's because he's familiar with disease, crushed with disease, and yet by his knowledge, he makes the many righteous. Not by his death, not by his blood, not by crucifixion, by his long life. And again, it starts out with the first six verses where we see there are people suffering a sickness. And uh, I'll get to that in just a second. So I, the righteous servant Elijah, though my name is Keith, clear the way for the building of the third temple. Because God says in Malachi, verse 1, uh, chapter, yeah, chapter 3, Behold, I am sending my messenger to clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall come to his temple suddenly. So the purpose of God that's not stated in Isaiah 53, it just says a purpose that might prosper is returning to his temple, which means it has to be rebuilt. So when his messenger is clearing the way for him, it's clearing the way for the rebuilding of the third temple of God. And this purpose of Elijah is a purpose that might prosper also. See, that's the connection. Elijah is supposed to draw the families of the Jewish people back together and do it through Judaism. He is to make them righteous. What is the man of Isaiah 53 called? God's righteous servant, the teacher of righteousness. And for what? A purpose of God that might prosper. Which is what? Building a third temple. And God says, if Elijah is not successful, when I do come, I'm coming with utter destruction. I will strike the land with utter destruction. That's how serious it is to be able to find Elijah. And that's why you have to have a description. Four men to come, one description. It's implicit, it's explicit. And there's no other way to look at it. And the sages would agree with me, I'm quite sure. That you have to have a description of these men. The things I hear on the internet, on YouTube, from the rabbis who talk about Moshiach and when he gets there and people ask them, how do we know he's here? What was, what, how, this and that, that and this. The, the answers are so very, and, and to me, so ridiculous. You know, you got to know who he is because he fits this description. It's what it's for. It's for the day of the Lord. Now, what's the, what's the day of the Lord about? Well, Jeremiah says, see, a time is coming. The ruined land, the desolate land, will be rebuilt again. The cities restored. Jerusalem rebuilt to a size greater than antiquity, which it is today. The land shall bloom again. This all started in 1948. 
See, your time is coming. I'll make a new covenant with you. Not like the covenant I made with your fathers out of Egypt. I'm going to forgive your sins and I'm going to remember them no more. And this will cause Torah to be written on your heart. Which is a metaphor for basically when Jewish people find out God is back and God is in what he said, that's going to draw. That's going to get these sick people back that are in the first six verses to righteousness. So there's a new covenant. So we look at Jeremiah, you got these three seed of time is coming, and, and, and you say, okay, well that's today. Because the land blooms again, Jerusalem's rebuilt, so the new covenant has to be here. What do we know about that? Who, who's going to deliver it? Well, you ask yourself, who delivered the first one? Moses. Who's supposed to come? A prophet like Moses. Well, what about the covenant itself? What else do we know about it? Malachi 3 verse 1. I'm sending my messenger to clear the way before me, and I shall return to my temple suddenly. And the angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. It's the day of the Lord. That's what ties the two together. And you got to have a prophet like Moses. You got to have you have to be able to describe a man who's a prophet of God. That's that's number one. And then he has to be able to do the things Moses did, which primarily is write the Torah. Uh, the Jewish people haven't been in bondage since the Israelites left in the Exodus, so that's that's not the issue. And a man who can talk to God face to face, friend to friend. So this is, this is what we're looking for. This is what everybody should have been looking for from the beginning. But particularly after the lands have become desolate and restored as they are today, which did not happen with the Assyrian Babylon exiles when they returned. They couldn't even go in to the northern kingdom because it was inhabited by Gentiles. That's another story too. But they didn't, they didn't revive all of Israel as it is today. This is when it occurs, and um, I can tell you it is occurring because he's been training me up for this for 13 years now. We're just now starting to make a splash and let people understand what's really happening. He's here. It is the day of the Lord. There's three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and it is unquestioned, at least in this room, this clear winner is Judaism. Do you have any question about it? And rightly so, what other people have suffered as they have? So this is what we're looking for. The man being described, when all the verses are taken together, is a sinful man whose life had been lowly, full of grievous events, serious injuries, and wounds, a man of pain and suffering, familiar with disease, that the Spirit of God alights upon, to the crown of God's righteous servant who makes the many righteous and rises to great heights. Other scripture says the stock of Jesse. Jesse is the father of King David, which we find in the first verse of chapter 11 of Isaiah. The stock of Jesse that has remained standing shall become a standard to peoples. Nations shall seek his counsel, and his abode shall be honored. That's Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. I, the righteous servant David, though my name is Keith, will have an abode that is humble when the Lord cuts me off from the land of the living, in Isaiah 53, well, I'll get to it. It happened to Ezekiel, too. From the world of material things in society to fit Isaiah 53, verse 8. And in the end, my abode is one to be honored in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. From a poor man to a rich man, with the many as my portion and the multitude as my spoil. Prosperous and held in high regard by many and the multitude 
of the Jewish people. Verse 14. Just as the many were appalled at him, so marred was his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human semblance. This is the beginning of identifying God's righteous servant in Isaiah 53 as a man with disfigurement, because not only is he afflicted by God, he is also blemished. And I'll get to it. It's very important that that was put into Isaiah 53. Usually you think of afflicted, afflicted with a disease. But these are separated. Another affliction is disfigurement at birth. King David would have nothing to do with the blind, the crippled, the lame. Because it was a sign in those days that God did not like you. He had nothing to do with him. You know, he's not a man without defects, such as lambs and rams for a sin offering and guilt offering in the Torah. In other words, God had Isaiah write that in, that this man was disfigured and afflicted with disease for one main purpose. Do not, do not try to use the animal, sacrificial, atonement, worship laws of Leviticus for this chapter, for this man, and that's just what the Christians did. And one rabbi that I know of, she may sacrifice is what that would be, but you know what you can't sacrifice? A defective, blemished lamb or ram. You can't do it. It's not acceptable and won't be accepted by God. And the Christians can't see it. They just can't see it. They're blind. As they say, the Jewish people are that that Isaiah 53 is prophetic of and describes Jesus Christ. I don't see him fitting a single verse, save one, but that's for another time. So, how could a man today fit the description of the Lord's righteous servant in Isaiah 52, 14, with his appearance marred, unlike that of man, a normal, normal man, unlike normal man, and just so more, he shall startle many nations in verse 52, 15. So he's more, his appearance is so awful you can't look upon him, it sounds like. But the truth of it is, he goes on to startle many nations. Nations seek his counsel. He makes them many righteous. So he is a person who can be looked upon. There is one way and still be alive to fulfill verse 52, 15. To describe a man who, who comes when the land blooms again, the ruined cities have been rebuilt, and Jerusalem has re been rebuilt to the size as it is today, which began about 70 years ago. By the way, God dictated a book to me, Isaiah 53 in the Day of the Lord. We had put together over almost 85 videos covering every single chapter uh, among other things, and in addition, uh, the second book he had me type, he dictated it. I had to learn everything. It's not straight dictation. It takes a lot of give and take, this and that, but every single word, every sentence, every paragraph, every chapter, the entirety of the book is God's. It's just like the Torah. Both of these books, and that's what I'm using. I mean, in other words, he had me put this together. I was an atheist for 50 years. I didn't know anything about Judaism. I didn't know what a Tanakh was. I didn't know what a Hebrew Bible was. I didn't. I never heard of anything like Isaiah 53. I never associated with religious people. I had no training. When I say I, I was an atheist, I was adamant. There is no God. And it's partly because, like so many people like me, when you go through tremendously bad things, you just, you just start thinking there's somebody who looks favorably on me. Nothing good ever happens. And I'll bear my own problems, thank you. That kind of attitude. <clears throat> now, if I were to be seen with all of my injuries from accidents and surgical operations at one time before healing, together with my congenital disfigurement, my appearance and features would be marred from that of normal man. This is my history. I was born prematurely in the seventh month without my right 
pectoral muscle with a shorter right shoulder and a withered arm. There's just no muscle on it, my right arm. <clears throat> I have a four inch wound from surgery to remove tissue above the missing right pectoral when I was two years old, my first surgery. My feet would have third degree burns from standing on the ashes of hot coals at a 4th of July celebration when I was four. My right knee would be a gaping wound from being impaled upon a broken glass bottle, Coca-Cola bottle. They just, they almost took that leg off. They didn't think I'd ever be able to use it. Uh, but uh, you, you would say a miracle happened. That one particular doctor who could repair it walked by that hospital uh, door and uh, my mom actually knew and he had repaired my uh, great grandmother's hip that she broke when she was about 90 years old. And this is back in 19, you know, the early 1960s. So not the medicine wasn't near as advanced as it is today. But anyway, he saved my leg. My left knee would be sliced open from broken glass. I crawled over playing a game when I was 11. My two front teeth would be gone, knocked out by a telephone receiver when I was 12. Each foot would be pierced twice with nails. <laughs> Were they 16? I stepped on at a construction site when I was 17. That's a funny story. It went, they went through my shoes and came up through the top. Uh, left foot in, right foot. My torso would be opened from the top of my rib cage vertically down to the uh, pelvic bone from surgery to repair a 22 caliber uh, gunshot to my abdomen. Um, it, it went in through my front right side and came and came out over here on my left back side. It, it was just like an angle, almost straight across almost straight across through me from about two feet away. <clears throat> and it, uh, it pierced my bladder, colon, and intestines, uh, and that was when I was 18. My upper jaw, the teeth, gums, and bone would be severed from my skull from orthodontic surgery with my face swollen to twice its normal size when I was 38. It was surgery done to try to realign my top teeth with my bottom because I had a perpetual headache. One for almost 27 years of suffering. And, and you know, the stories behind all these accidents and events and how I survived them is very interesting. And that's what the second book's about. It's called The Life of the Righteous Servant, of God's Righteous Servant of Isaiah 53 which he also dictated to me, even though it was my life, and it's primarily to show how I fit these verses. Because that's why he came to me at birth but didn't talk to me till I was 50, is to make sure I fit these verses. You know, he, he, he said he came to Jeremiah at the womb, and he was a priestly man. He had a great life doing God's work, uh, even though he was one of the uh, uh, Babylon exiles. God came to me for a different purpose, to make sure I had a life of suffering, to make sure I fit these verses, and to prepare me in all kinds of other ways that I just, I didn't know. He, he basically orchestrated my life without my knowledge, and me all the time being an atheist. Um, but the, these stories are in that book. Uh, the first seven chapters are just about me, that's pretty easy read, you know, just accidents that happen. Uh, and then it picks up with the chapter where he, he speaks to me for the first time. And then there's an additional seven chapters culminating with what I'm reading to you right now. Uh, it's called uh, chapter 16, Isaiah 53, colon, uh, Keith McCarty, verse by verse. That's what he had me right there. The skin of my chest would be open from a six inch in diameter circular cut to remove skin cancer when I was 43. My torso was opened again to remove a six to eight inch malignant cancerous tumor that had burst through my colon when I was 44 and again in my 50s for abdominal uh, hernia mesh surgery. 
I'm 63 today. God spoke to me at 50. He, as I said, he's been training me up for this for 13 years and teaching me all this. My left hand would be broken from a fall on a tennis court when I was 28 and broken again walking on stones in a creek when I was 55. My ankles would be bruised and swollen from severe sprains while playing basketball and running at various ages. My chin would be lacerated from striking a wall at the end of a foot race when I was 21 and I would be covered with the childhood diseases of measles and mumps. Now, if you, could, if you could just imagine all that at one time, before healing, you know, it's just, it's kind of like the passion of the Christ. You know, they say he sits all these things. You know, he had nails in his hands and his feet, and he had been with. I'm sure his, his back was lacerated. But um, in any event, this man's supposed to live. This is... A, this is how a man can fit the description of the Lord's righteous servant in Isaiah 52, 14, and just so he shall startle many nations. Kings shall be silenced because of him, for they shall see what has not been told them, shall behold what they never have heard. So that's Isaiah 52, 15. And I can promise you, I can promise you, Judaism, the rabbis, Christians, these are, these are things they have never been told and uh, behold what they have never heard. That's what this is. And, you know, despite this language being in here, and God put it in here for a reason, had Isaiah write it, just as he has me write, just as he had Moses write. You know, that's how the book came together, the Hebrew Bible. He had it all written, not just the Torah. Okay, so, nations, the Gentiles, stolen and kings, leader of nations, silenced by seeing the following. God's righteous servant, his servant David, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses as one man. Hearing that God's righteous servant arrives in the time to come of Jeremiah 31, which is the day of the Lord. That God's righteous servant is the only man to come who is described in the scripture and is inherently and implicitly the anointed one, David. God calls, you know, they, they call him King Moshe, uh, Rambam did. And uh, he, he's thought of as, as being a king. Ezekiel, I mean, you know, you only see the anointed one, Moshe, in chapter 11. And, and God just says, my spirit's going to light upon a, a descendant of King David, and then in Ezekiel, and he calls him uh, my servant, my servant David, a shepherd. But back when Rambam was writing, uh, and when the town was put together, kingdoms were, well, as you've heard, there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. So if there's a descendant of David coming back, then it's thought that the Davidic uh, dynasty would be resurrected. Well, we, that's not going to happen today. And God knew when this time to come was going to be, for the most part, to the very day. But, uh, and, that, and that Israel will be a democrat country. So, to get all the kingdoms and this and that that you hear taught about this uh, messianic era uh, that the, uh, the rabbis teach. That the Jewish people throughout the world are forgiven by God of all their inequities and sin by God's written word in the day of the Lord. That's under the new covenant. The Christians aren't going to believe it because they took that new covenant. No, they, they didn't take it. They said it's been abolished. It's obsolete. We have a newer, newer covenant, and that's Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can find righteousness is through faith in Jesus and the resurrection. You can't be righteous under the law. Okay, I can only put a half an hour on my uh,
camera at a time and it just ran out. But let me pick back up and keep going. That heaven is being created for only the Jewish people. That God's righteous servant, like Isaiah 53, is a Gentile. That's going to floor everybody. There are Christians who believe that man describes Jewish. And you can better believe Judaism does too. Even though, uh, not the man described in Isaiah 53, but the Messiah of Isaiah chapter 11. Well, he's not. And God had good reasons for that. Very good reasons. And that's in the beginning. When we make it to Israel, I'm going to convert Orthodox and become a Jew. That Jesus, being a Jew, cannot be God's righteous servant. And there's one reason right there. Isaiah 53 can't be used for human sacrifice. You cannot use Leviticus. The unblemished Lamb of God cannot be in Isaiah 53. He had to be an unblemished perfect Lamb, and he was. This man, this man's afflicted with disfigurement and blemished with disease. And they just can't see. But God, and God knew they would. And that's why he put it in. And that's why I've had to suffer all these things. Oh, he gave me the cancer. He orchestrated me getting shot through the abdomen. I call it gut shot. I said, God, gut shot me to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> we laugh. But, um, but he also made sure I didn't die. And, well, anyway, I'll get to it. That God's righteous servants were made with disease and crushed with disease, blemished, defective, and could never be an offer for sacrifice. That a host of the Lord's host is a man and divine beings. Now I know Judaism doesn't know what that is, because Jacob, Jacob wrestled with a man and divine beings, and Judaism says he wrestled with an angel. No, he wrestled with a man who the Spirit of God had lit upon and entered, as we see with Ezekiel, and lit upon, as in chapter 11 by Isaiah, and you could hear God speak. Well, that's two things. That's the Holy Spirit of God. He's a person. He's also known as the angel of his presence. He's an angel, and he's spirit. And I have videos on that. So, and there's God. And they just went to a man nearby, I said, wake up. You see this fellow over here sleeping? His name's Jacob. Go jump on him and start wrestling. <laughs> and he said, you know, don't worry about it. I'm going to put the cords of my power around you. I'll orchestrate the whole thing. Uh, you won't get hurt. And then through that man, God spoke to Jacob and changed his name to Israel. And that's where, that's where it all really starts. It started with Abram, uh, the Hebrew, who became Abraham. But on and on. But, and that is, that man, if God comes to you, that, that man was a host of the Lord's host. And I have videos on that. There's, there's four or five other examples, in, powerful examples in the scripture on that. But only one place you can place a man as being a host of the Lord's host. It's the captain of the Lord's host. <clears throat> ah, he's right here. That the captain of the Lord's host is a Gentile and a harbinger of God's righteous servant. That would be me. See, I'm a man in divine being. God's spirit lit upon me and God is in his spirit. That God's righteous servant becomes a man divine being when God's spirit, who is the angel of his presence, the angel of the Lord, and the Holy Spirit alights upon him in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. That God is redeeming the Jewish people in the same manner that he did in the Hebrew Bible with one man. That the time to come of Jeremiah 31 began when the state of Israel was created, 1948. And that God's righteous servant fulfills and completes the remaining six prophecies of God in the day of the Lord. By the way, the second covenant is a covenant of friendship that God grants when David arrives. When Moshe gets here, God's got to be here, which, you know, it all goes together after a while. 
But in that uh, covenant of friendship, it's in two parts, Ezekiel 34 and chapter 37. But uh, in 37, I believe it is, he says, I shall place my sanctuary amongst you forever. So when that was done and it was written by Ezekiel, uh, God already knew in the day of the Lord there was not going to be a temple, that he was going to have to place one there or have it, have it done using using his servant to get it going. Now, no single man can do it. You know, and if, if, if the effort fails, if the prophet's not recognized, if Elijah's not recognized, utter destruction to the land. And God doesn't mean he's going to do it in his power. It's just like, it's just like uh, Assyrian, um, it's just like him raising up armies. His creation's going to do it, not him himself. He likes to use himself in, in the third or first person or third person. Um, this it, it makes it more likely to happen that 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 he, he's really trying to instill fear of who he is. But what it means is, if this is not, doesn't get done, if he didn't get back into that temple, see, building the temple is what's going to keep Israel safe forever, from now on in the Middle East, and it's always perilous there for them. That's what has to be done. And God's saying, if we don't get it done, the day will come, Israel, you're going to be utterly destroyed. There's 7 million Israeli Jews to the day. If the land is utterly destroyed, I would guess a minimum of 6 million people are going to die, and that should ring a bell, a bell that says, Never forget. Don't think it can't happen. Okay, picking up with uh, the actual chapter 53 that we have in, in the Bible. As I said, it, it actually starts at 52, 13. The first speakers of Isaiah 53 are the witnesses of the righteous servant in the quoted multiple verses 1 through 6. The many who are made righteous by God's righteous servant. Verse 1. Who can believe what we have heard? I just went through a whole lot of that and I got some more to add to it. Who can believe what we are hearing? Upon whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The witnesses ask, who can believe that God redeems the Jewish people by the new covenant with sin forgiveness that is delivered by the messenger Elijah, who receives it from the angel of the covenant, who is the angel of God's presence, the Holy Spirit, that alights upon the anointed one in Isaiah chapter 11, redeemed by the covenant of friendship that comes with his Servant David, when he sanctifies Israel by having the third temple built on his holy Mount Zion in Jerusalem, redeemed by speaking to his prophets again. The Jewish people say, we told you we were right. We told you we were right all along. And God is speaking to his prophet again. Explain all these things if you can, but you cannot. Who can believe what we have heard? <clears throat> and uh, his prophet again as he spoke to Moses, face to face and friend to friend. Now, I can explain what that means, face to face. A lot of people don't get that. And all by and with one man, the Lord calls my righteous servant. Rambam says in chapter 12 of the laws concerning King Moshe, that Moshe will compel all of Israel to walk in the way of the Torah, perfect the entire world, motivating all the nations to serve God together. There will be neither famine nor war, neither envy nor competition. The entire world will be solely to know God. And the Jews will therefore be great sages and know the hidden matters with an understanding of their creator to the full extent of human potential. <laughs> I can tell you with God telling me what to do moment to moment as he does every day, including when to go to sleep, when to get up, and when to eat, and what to eat. 
I cannot get any of that done. <laughs> I can't protect the world and I can't get all of Israel to follow the Torah. This is what God actually says, grand man. He says, He will send down the rain in its season. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit and the land shall yield its produce. The Jewish people shall continue secure on their own soil and never be overthrown and uprooted again. If we get that temple built. <laughs> when we get the temple built. And that's nothing to, to look at and go, well, that can't be done. No, not today, it couldn't. But we're talking about 10, 20 years from now. Remember, I've been getting a long life. Moses was 120 when he died. I'm 63. I should have been dead a long time ago, three or four times. But I'll get to some of that. They shall no longer be a spoil for the nations. He will establish for them a planting of renown. They shall no more be carried off by famine. They shall not have to bear the taunts of the nations. Anti-Semitism. He will establish them and multiply them. He will place his sanctuary among them forever. His presence shall rest over them. And when his sanctuary abides among them forever, the nations will know that the Lord sanctifies Israel. Who would believe that one man fulfills and completes the remaining prophecies of God in the day of the Lord? Okay, I just went over that. The witnesses report, and who would believe it, that they had not been told by their wise men, sages, rabbis, and theologians that God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 is a Gentile. In the beginning. Isaiah 63 says God comes from Adam that is interpreted in Judaism to be Christianity and means he is coming from a Christian country. And of the people, Jewish people, none are with him. Okay, I have some videos. There's so much more information on this. This idea, uh, Adam's associated with Jacob's, who is Israel, Jacob's brother, Esau. They're like eternal enemies. And Esau immediately started marrying Gentile women, Edomites and things like this. His whole, genera his whole uh, I guess, generations from him are considered Gentiles. So Esau is considered Gentile. And uh, that's why the reference becomes Rome, uh, who were obviously Gentiles. And then it became Christian Rome. And then Rome fell. And now references are to Christianity. Because there's still things uh, God says he's going to have to do with Adam. And of course there is no Adam anymore. That would have been, uh, uh, it's kind of like Moab. Um, and Basra was its main city, but it would be in the country Jordan today, and it was destroyed a long time ago. So, and, and, and the Jewish people in the Exodus, they weren't allowed to pass through Adam. God has never come from Adam. So anyway, he's going to be coming from a Christian country. And no Jews are with him, no Jewish peoples, and uh, he's come from a Christian country with the Gentile. So, things you never heard. The witnesses report that they have never heard that the captain of the Lord's host is a Gentile and a harbinger of God's righteous servant, who is a Gentile, just as Elijah the Tishbite. I don't think most people understand that. Elijah is a, a Gentile. And he becomes the host of the Lord's host, the man of divine beings. Um, there's no Tishbites in the Bible. There's lots of genealogy, especially in Chronicles. There's no Tishbites. There's no clan of a Tishbite. And it, it also specifically says, I'm pretty sure more than once, an inhabitant of Ramoth Gilead. Verse 5. But he was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our iniquities. He bore the chastisement that made us whole, and by his bruises we were healed. 
The book of Ezekiel is the key to understanding Isaiah 53. The purpose of Ezekiel was to be a prophet and teacher of righteousness to the exiles of Assyria, Babylonia, by bringing them to repentance with restitution. To prepare him, God said, I will make your face as hard as theirs and your forehead as brazen as theirs. I will make your forehead like adamant, harder than flint. Do not fear them and do not be dismayed by them. And God maltreats and punishes him for the punishment of the houses of Israel and Judah for their sins. For 430 days he's pinned to the ground, punished, maltreated, crushed, bruised, eating nothing but bread, and chastised by the words of God. God's righteous servant, that is his name, is a man of suffering throughout his life, with persistent hardships and troubles, grievously affected, especially by disease, and severely injured at one time or another. A man of many bruises and stripes, my stripes and my scars. These are the qualities that identify me as God's righteous servant, who makes the many righteous. And I had been wounded, punished, maltreated, crushed, bruised, and chastised by the power and words of God to make my face as hard as the Jewish people, my forehead as brazen as theirs, and like adamant, harder than flint. So I do not fear them, and I will not be dismayed by them. There's a lot more to this process. God's power is involved with changing my emotions and just just teaching me and making me more knowledgeable and how to uh, deal with belligerent, mean, ugly people and things like that. Uh, but his power has a lot to do with it. You know, uh, he, he can make me, he showed me this years ago, he can make me completely emotionless. I don't fear anything. My adrenaline won't rush. My anger won't spark. I mean, he, he can do that in his power. And as you can imagine, I'm going to need all his help I can get. Verse 6, we all went astray like sheep, each going his own way. And the Lord visited upon him the guilt of all of us. We all went astray like sheep. That would be the Jewish people. Uh, this is verse 6, the, the last by the witnesses, who are the witnesses and speakers of 1 through 6. They had stopped following the laws of God in one manner or another. As they say, he, the guilt is, is visited on him. Well, in verse 10, I offered myself for guilt. That's the guilt we're talking about. Of being sinners. The man is made to be, he becomes God's righteous servant. That's the story of the whole thing. So, I accepted God's offer of possibly, possibly, it says he might have long life, possibly having a long life after being crushed with disease in return of offering myself for guilt. It's a covenant between me and God. God and the Gentile, a covenant. It, it, it's an agreement. I mean, basically he's put me to that test. You agree to go through my fire of refinement. And he's trying to tell me how awful it is and what it's going to take and how it's going to change me. And, 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 and then he makes it tough by saying, I might give you long life. So you're like, i got to go through all that, not really understanding it, and you might give me long life? He said, that's, that's correct. Will you offer yourself for guilt or not? You know, that's how he's talking to you. He's kind of like, well, <laughs> <laughs> you can't. You know better than to say, can I have a moment to think about that? You know better. You just do. You just... <laughs> and you know, you can't take the guilt of other persons. I offer myself for the guilt of the Jewish people for their sinning. These witnesses. And uh, the many and the multitude made righteous. Um, 
So, I mean, you already know this is figurative language. I mean, you know, I can't take the guilt of the Jewish people. Does that mean every Jew in the world, all of a sudden, they don't feel guilt? I mean, they, they, they're known for that. They're feeling guilt because the world is oppressing so much. Uh, you know, it's a stereotype, but it's one that has been there a long time. Uh, but so basically, those who remain righteous no longer feel guilt, though I do suffer greatly in God's fire of refinement. So that's the last, last of the verses by the witnesses. The second speaker of Isaiah 53 is Isaiah himself, the prophet, in verses 7 through 10. Verse 7, he was maltreated, yet he was submissive. He did not open his mouth. Like a sheep being led to slaughter, like a ooh, dumb, before those who shear her, he did not open his mouth. Okay, breaking it down, he was maltreated, yet he was submissive. Okay, maltreatment, that's just part of God's fire of refinement. I mean, when God maltreats you, let's just say this, you haven't been maltreated until God does it. He's very good. Uh, it hurts because it's God. You know, it's, it, I mean, you know, your wife or your kids maltreat you, that hurts. But until you've been maltreated by God, you know, you, you, there's a whole other level to go to. Uh, and again, he's just drawing emotions from me. Uh, to, to change me. And with God, you're always submissive. Ezekiel said he went in bitterness and the fury of his spirit in the hand of God. That's the fire of refinement. I mean, if you're in the hand of God, you feel like you're safe, things are going to be good, he's going to help you out of your problems. No, Ezekiel says he's just living. <laughs> furious <laughs> and they're bitter not happy see he didn't ask him he didn't make a covenant with Ezekiel Ezekiel said the spirit sees me God, didn't, God doesn't have to ask you to be a prophet God doesn't have to ask you to go through his fire of refinement there's so many reasons for that uh, this, this figure of speech that uh, I go to a lot more detail in the books particularly and in some videos And so that's what he's doing with Ezekiel when he pins him to the ground, makes him eat bread, uh, says some bad words to him. It makes you meek and humble. Um, you know, it dulls your emotions. Uh, you feel in your anger. Uh, and he showed me that he can remove my emotions entirely. He can make me like ice where absolutely nothing can bother me or feel anything. You know, which as you can imagine, there's going to be plenty of people not too happy with me, like two billion Christians and two billion Muslims and probably a good bit of the Jewish religious community. They're just going to say, that's not what we believe. You know, it's religion. I, I'm still trying to run it, but I do, I know enough. It's also a removal of self-will. God has absolute control over me. His power envelops my body, my head, my mind. Uh, I don't make any decisions of my own. Uh, one of the first things he had me do was terminate my law licenses. I had a license in Hawaii and uh, here in Texas where I, uh, is where I always practice. And uh, I was a uh, board certified specialist in oil, gas, and mineral law. And he said, that's it. You're not practicing law again. And he actually had me terminate my license. <laughs> I said, what am I going to do for money? He said, you're not going to have money. I said, okay. See, that's an treatment right there. Terminate your law license and then get smart with it. Oh, <laughs> he's rough people. But he's a great, he's a great person. He did not open his mouth. Okay, when God revealed himself to me in 2007, he took me from the world, the land of the living and material things, alone, no more working, 
no phone, no car, no computer, no law licenses, no bank account, no credit cards, and no money without explanation to friends and family. Silent as a lamb. I mean, to everybody, it's just like, I just disappeared. You know, you just, no work, no social life, no friends, no money. You can't do anything. Verse 8. By a pressing judgment, he was taken away. Who could describe his abode? For he was cut off from the land of the living. That's what I was just talking about. Through the sin of my people who deserved the punishment. Again, that's figure to speech. Okay, I wasn't taken away because of the sin of the Jewish people. It's just that I'm going to be the righteous servant. They've been sinning. I'm going to bring them back into righteousness through Judaism. And, uh, you know, I'm the one getting punished. And, you know, when you think about it, a sinner, especially when they die, they, they may get punished then. It's not really true. I have a lot of information on that. Again, I had the knowledge of Elijah. Okay. I, I, as far as anything and everything unseen uh, from the heavens, from heaven, how angels are created, how Adam was created as a man. Think about that. You know, you know, we kind of grow up and evolve uh, in our learning and our knowledge of those things around us. And, and all of a sudden, he just comes to be, and he's already a full-grown man. I know all about that. By oppressive judgment, he was taken away. Okay, the oppressive judgment is being guilty and receiving a sentence of imprisonment and the maltreatment, chastisement, punishment, bruising, and crushing until suitable for God's purpose. A purpose that includes making the many righteous. Okay, I've written two books, as the prophet like Moses would. I've put together almost 85 videos now at God's command and direction, the very words I use, and this is the books themselves. And uh, I'm still in the fire of fire. It has gotten tougher more painful uh, every year. And he has not let up on me. I mean, doing these videos and writing the books is about the only time he lets up on me. Um, so I really enjoy doing this. <laughs> Who could describe his abode? Well, all of Israel will be able to describe my abode uh, of the righteous servant because of social media and phones with cameras and abode to be honored in Isaiah 11. I would like to see somebody, and Jesus did have a house. I'd like to see somebody describe that. It's not described in the uh, New Testament. My abode today is room and board in return for care and assistance to my elderly parents in a townhome in Houston, Texas. Uh, my dad's 93. My mom's 86 or 7. Uh, their, their condo is paid for, and we... For all these years, have been living on their social security uh, for you know keeping the house going and food. Uh, I just recently filed early uh, retirement, social security retirement at age 63. So I now receive a check, but I give it all to them. Uh, I'm so used to not having money and just you know uh, just being with God and His Spirit and not people. Uh, but anyway, uh, verse 9, And his grave was set among the wicked, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no injustice and had spoken no falsehood. This verse says the righteous servant of God was poor, but dies a rich man. The righteous servant of God becomes poor when God cuts him off from the world and then he is given the many as his portion and receives the multitude as his spoil. And his abode will be honored. He will die a rich man. Verse 10. But the Lord chose to crush him by disease that if he made himself an offering for guilt, he might see offspring and have long life, and that through him the Lord's purpose might prosper. So he might be given long life, and the Lord's purpose might prosper. 
God's righteous servant will be familiar with disease and his life crushed because of disease that he is afflicted with by the power of God. God has shown me how he orchestrated my being shot in the abdomen in a vision back to October 5 of 1975 by altering my perceptions. Had he not done that, I would have removed myself from harm's way. And you can also find that um, in Isaiah chapter 11, I believe it's verse 3, that he will not make judgments and decisions by what his eyes and ears perceive. God will decide what I perceive. He'll decide my judgments and he decides my uh, decisions and what my eyes see. The bullet passed through my colon, bladder, and intestines. I was 18, and this is when the doctor said a tumor began growing in my colon based on its size when surgically removed when I was 44 years old, shortly after the 9-11 terrorist attack on New York. God tells me that the trauma to my colon activated dormant cancer cells and in his power. He made sure they did not go dormant again. And from, now I survived the colon cancer. Uh, they had to open me up just as they did with the bullet wound from stem to stern. I uh, remove about an eight inch tumor that had burst through my colon. I had been bleeding internally for months. Um, and it metastasized. It spread to my lungs. I didn't know that at the time though, but so anyway, they removed the, the tumor and I took chemotherapy for colon cancer. And then they had me come back in uh, months later and uh, started running more tests. And that's when they found lung cancer x-rays of my lungs, uh, you know, my chemo had been specific to colon cancer. Uh, and then, uh, you know, my dad's sitting right there with me. And they took the x-rays twice, and they showed them to me, and it's just white spots all over my lungs. And they said, uh, the white spots are cancer, and it's too advanced for us to even try and treat. And I said, well, what does that mean? You, you can't treat it. And he says, it's, just, it's, it's too advanced, so you, you, you're going to die, and you're going to die real soon, as in a month or so. Um, and as I, I think I've already mentioned all this, but uh, in, in verse 12 says, he was exposed to death. But uh, that was when the planes hit New York. I'm sure I must have covered this in... Uh, Chapter 52, verses 13 through 15. Uh, but in any event, I, had, I never went to see a doctor again. I mean, I just walked out there and that was it. You know? uh, but I wasn't experiencing symptoms. And I even mentioned that to him. You know, I wasn't coughing. I wasn't hacking up blood. Uh, I, I, there was no shortness of breath. You know, nothing to really tell me that I was about to die of lung cancer. And I know now why. God knew they were going to be taking those pictures. And that's when he, in his power, gave me lung cancer, advanced stage four lung cancer. And then after the pictures, he removed it. But I didn't know that. And so I, it, it crushed my life. But it wasn't because I was, you know, uh, went through this horrible ordeal in a hospital like I've seen pictures of Lance Armstrong, the great bicyclist, uh, what he went through, and of course he came out of it with incredible treatment and surgeries. I just left the hospital um, and, and never really experienced lung cancer. Now I did the colon cancer, that was brutal. It was really bad. I didn't know what was wrong with me. Uh, but not the lung cancer. And, and that's how God crushed me with disease. And I was familiar with the disease, and I had skin cancer. So, um, in any event, um, that he would make himself an offering for guilt, it's an offer. It's an offering of oneself and soul to God for the guilt 
of the sinning of the Jewish people, in particular the many made righteous who were the witnesses of verses 1 through 6. And that was in return for possibly having long life and seeing my children. I have three, by the way. Um, as a, it was a covenant between me and him. You offer yourself for guilt, I might give you long life. But here's what, and then he explained to me, the fire refinery, he said, well, what's really going on is, he says, you can't, you can't take the guilt of the Jewish people, okay? That's figurative speech. Uh, but I did, you know, it, it's kind of the way it evolved. I mean, at first he put it to me, you just got to do it. And of course, I've been told I was going to die. And, and here's God telling me, I might give you a long life. Well, I'm going to accept that. The offering is only a test of my devotion to him and to his purpose which he had been explaining to me, and who I was going to be and become. It's very similar to the binding of Isaac. I mean, God knew all along he wasn't going to let Abraham uh, kill Isaac. He knew all along, but Abraham didn't know that. And so when, this, when we were first talking that, I didn't know that. And he's telling me, you know, all these things like wounding, maltreatment, as we go through Isaiah 53, uh, punishment, chastisement, bruising, crushing, in his power is what he's talking about. So when the test of devotion, will he offer himself for guilt? and go through God's fine refinement or not. It's set before me, okay? But here's the kicker. The new covenant had already arrived. In Malachi 3, God says, I'm sending um, my messenger to clear the way for me, and I'm returning to my temple suddenly. The angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. And I often thought about that. Why is he already on the way? I may have even asked that about it, but he didn't answer me, which is not unusual, by the way. It's because of this test of devotion. They're sin free when he asked me, and I said, yes, I'll accept the guilt of the Jewish people for their sins. There was no sin. That's why the angel with the new covenant of sin forgiveness already has has already left before God. That's what that's all that, that that's why that's there and I promise you nobody has ever figured that out before. In any event, uh, and that would hold true for Jesus because he said his cousin, John the Baptist, was Elijah. Well if he's Elijah, you're at Malachi three in the day of the Lord. And that means all the Jews would have been sin free under the covenant. That would have been the time to come. The time of Jesus, his life instead of mine. Okay, for all kinds of reasons, that's not possible. Um, and interestingly, Jesus uses Malachi 3, verse 1, that I'm talking about, to describe his cousin John the Baptist as Elijah. But guess what he leaves out? The angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. He put in the part, I'm sending my messenger before me. Okay, and later on uh, in that chapter, towards the end, it's, uh, uh, it's when we hear that Elijah is there. And he's the messenger. He's the only uh, man mentioned in that chapter. So, uh, yeah, the New Testament leaves the angel out and the new covenant and sin forgiveness because how can Jesus go to the cross for the sins of the Jewish people if God's already forgiven them by his written word to be brought and delivered by Elijah? That's what he's the messenger of, the new covenant. And...
So the reality is there is no guilt or sin for the man to bear. The primary purpose of verse 10 is not to test the devotion. Will you offer yourself for guilt or not? It's to make certain that the animal, sacrificial, atonement, worship laws of the Torah cannot be used for the man described. Because God knew what the Gentiles were going to do. He knew they were going to have an unblemished lamb of God. That's their story with the Jewish people, and then this story says that the atonement for the Jewish people that Jesus died for was transferred to them. I mean, there's so much wrong in all that, and really, it's so important to read the books. The videos are good, but, uh, you know, so much of this coming out in my words, when, when God has me right, uh, it just comes out clear. There's no other reason God would crush a man with disease. He didn't crush Ezekiel with disease. He goes through the same things except for the wounds uh, as the man of Isaiah 53. It's the same words. He's maltreated. He's punished. He's told you're being punished for uh, the punishment of the houses of uh, Judah and Israel. And bruised and crushed. Well, if you're pinned to the ground for over a year, you, you're going to be bruised and you're going to be crushed. Because it's God's power that's keeping them there on the ground. I'm very familiar with that power. I have been pinned more than one time in that power. Uh, for no other reason to be able to understand what Ezekiel went through. And, but that, that's why God afflicted me, uh, blemished me, afflicted me, crushed me with disease. That's why I had to go through it. Because of Christianity. Because of Jesus Christ. I had to suffer cancer. And why, how they cannot see those words, I don't know. Now, they don't have crushed with disease, which is the proper translation. They have uh, brought to grief with sickness. Well, you don't get, and, and he's exposed to death. So this sickness is deadly. And, of course, Jesus has never been sick any place in the New Testament. It doesn't even show up. So whether you want to call it sickness and grief, you don't come to grief because because you got a cold or you're just sick and you got to miss a few weeks of work or something. You don't come to grief from that. You come to grief from cancer and being told you're going to die. Um, but that's why it's in there. See, I fit these verses. Jesus does not, and most certainly the Jewish people, as the man Israel, don't fit it either. When were they all together at one time? Every single Jew on the planet gathered and crushed with disease by God. When did they make the many righteous by their knowledge? As one man, all together. It's never happened. It's a foolish argument to put them in there. Foolish. It's an absurdity, actually. It's, well, between the two, I, I, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. Which one's worse, putting Jesus in there or putting uh, the Jewish people as the man is with? Everybody can make their own decision. And, you know, you're not going to refuse God anyway. If God comes to you and says, I want you to be my prophet, and I'm going to put you through a fire of fire that you're going to beg to die, you're going to beg to come out of a thousand times. You know what you say? Okay, here I am. Let's go. Let's start. That's what you say. You don't say no to God. So that's what all that's about. That, and it's a description of a man that you can find. That's me. I fit it. And God made sure of it. That's why it came to me in the wooden so to speak. But he didn't speak to me for 50 years. He's orchestrating my life to make sure. I live a suffering, painful, wounding <laughs> life. And he did a good job. It was tough. And I had a headache for 27 years. There's a long story and it's in, in, in the book, but um, he showed me how he had caused that. It, it was like a TMJ, temporal mandibular joint. Uh, 
the being torn up and it was from grinding my teeth every night as though I had post-traumatic stress disorder. And there's reasons for that outside of the gunshot. But that's a little bit too detailed for this. Verse 11. Out of his anguish, he shall see it. He shall enjoy it to the full through his devotion. By his knowledge, my righteous servant makes the many righteous. Now, verses 11 and 12, this is now God speaking. Now, he's the final speaker. 7 through 10 was Isaiah. 1 through 6 was uh, the witnesses to the righteous servant who were made righteous. Okay, so out of his anguish, he shall see it. He shall enjoy it to the full to his devotion. This is a reference to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, where one of the attributes of the Spirit that relies upon the anointed one, Meshiach, is a spirit of devotion and reverence for the Lord. The anguish, the anguish is the emotional and physical pain I have suffered by punishment in the power of of the Lord of hosts to make me suitable for his purpose. And his purpose is make my people righteous. I, I need a prophet like Moses. I got, this is the day of the Lord. I got to give it. I, I, I'm promising them in a covenant of friendship that I'm going to place my temple back amongst them. When David's here, Moshe at the anointing one, all this, all this happens at the same time and Jeremiah tells us when. When the desolate lands are restored, when they bloom again, the cities restored, Jerusalem rebuilt to a size greater than antiquity, and it is. It's, it's today. That's what it's for. It can't apply, Jeremiah wrote this, it can't apply to the Assyrian Babylonian exiles because they had nothing to do with the lands of the northern kingdom. If you want to say it become desolate, but it had, there were Gentiles there. There were Gentiles imported from Assyria when the northern kingdom was defeated and deported. They even tried to stop the building of the second temple. So, I mean, and there's, there's many other reasons, but that would be the easiest one to discuss. Verse 12, Assuredly, I will give him the many as his portion, he shall receive the multitude as his fault. For he exposed himself to death and was numbered amongst the sinners, whereas he bore the guilt of the many and made intercession for sinners. How do the Christians explain them? He's numbered a sinner. He's a sinner among sinners. They say this. They say, oh, uh, Jesus was crucified with a sinner to his left and a sinner to his right. So, one, two, three, he's counted as sin. Now, we're trying to find somebody. This is a description of a man in these verses. We're trying to find somebody. Not making up things to say, oh, well, uh, well we know he's not a sinner. He's the unblemished man of God, but He's numbered the sinner because he was crucified with sinners to his left and his right. Okay. I call that Christian logic. You know, same thing is, how, how, how does an unblemished lamb of God fit into a chapter where the man is blemished and familiar with disease and crushed with disease? How do you fit an unblemished lamb in there? And, of course, all of that comes back to Leviticus. If you offer a perfect, unblemished lamb uh, for sacrifice, you will forgive of your unintentional sins of that year. You know, if you had done that. And, by the way, yeah, it's, it's not intentional sins. It's only unintentional sins. For he exposed himself to death. Jesus was never exposed to death. He died. Okay? He's crucified and he died. 
There's no other time in his life he was exposed to death. You know, when I was born, they told my parents to take him home, born premature, seventh month. They just take him home. His intestines haven't formed correctly. He cannot eat, and he's not going to be able to. Just take him home. He's not going to make it. Uh, but I did. I survived. There's a story about it. Uh, as with so many things, uh, I've been shot, shot to the abdomen. It was eight hours before I could get to a hospital. I was way out in rural Texas, and uh, they could do anything. Um, you know, and they, we went to a small hospital, and they said, we got to send you to Houston. We can't do anything. I said, can you give me something for pain? They said, no, your vital signs are way too low. If we gave you morphine right now, you'd just drop flat out dead. That's where I was when I got, and I was still some six, seven hours from Houston, and I had to hold on with everything I had. I was exposed to death. I was ready to, you know, I just knew I couldn't, couldn't fall asleep, couldn't shut my eyes. I'd never come back. Oh, and uh, I am number one sinner. I've had plenty of things. God, God pointed a bunch of them out in visions to me. As a matter of fact, it was as if, if you've ever seen the, the movie or read the book Scrooge or the, the Ghost of Christmas Past with Charles Dickens. Oh, A Christmas Carol. He took me back in visions to all these different times I was sinning. And, uh, and I, I, it's not like I was an habitual sinner. It just does seem that I, I ran the gamut. It just wasn't much I left on the table when it came to what's, what's the sin. You know, I never murdered anybody. But uh, yeah, there was a lot more sins than I thought. Because I told him, I, I don't think I was that much of a sinner. I'm good to people. I don't like to hurt people or anything. I don't even like to hunt or step on, step on bugs. But uh, tell me that there was a lot more to it than I thought. Anyway... Uh, I hope this has been informative. You're going to be hearing about me for a long time. Uh, all this talk about building the third temple, that's years in the, in the future. God tells me, don't even think about it. Because I told him, I said, well, that would be impossible today. He said, it won't be that day. It could be 10, 20 years from now, but things will change in the Middle East. You'll see. So uh, that's where we are. And right now the focus is on his passing, his wrath. In chapter 51, which, of course, moves into the description of the righteous servant in 52 and 53. Uh, he passes his wrath to uh, the Christians. He tells his people, I'm passing my, uh, the cup of my wrath, my bowl of reading from you to those who told you to get down on the ground and walked all over you. That would be the Christians who sold their book and told them they didn't know how to read it. That they didn't know Isaiah 53. Describe Jesus Christ. Arrogance. And God says of Adam, I'm going to tear you down from your high cliffs with your arrogance. So that's kind of what we're going to be focusing on for quite some time. But to do that, I have to be believed. I have to be lifted up high. Because nothing's going to make them more angry than that. that. That the Jewish people are saying, see, we told you. Here's the guy of Isaiah 53. It's got nothing to do with you, Jesus. Thank you very much for listening.